The Conspiracy Against the Human Race, A Contrivance of Horror by Thomas Ligorty. Hi, I'm Bri. This is an extension of my Philosophics blog at http colon slash slash philosophicsblog.wordpress.com, where I write about philosophical topics that I find interesting. I also engage in political and economic conversations. If you haven't already, like and subscribe. In this segment, I'll be reviewing a book by Thomas Ligorty, The Conspiracy Against the Human Race, A Contrivance of Horror. I haven't done any book reviews, but since I tend to read a lot of books, I figure why not share my take and see how it's received. If you like these reviews, click the like button, and I'll consider creating more. Let's get started. First, I'll be providing a little background, and then I'll summarize some of the content and main themes. I'll close with my review and perspective. The author is Thomas Ligorty. He is a published writer in the horror genre in the vein of Lovecraft's atmospheric horror. I've not read any of his work and haven't read much fiction in ages. The Conspiracy Against the Human Race is Ligorty's first work of non-fiction. The book was originally published in 2010. I read the 2018 paperback version published by Penguin Books. Conspiracy Against the Human Race falls into the category of ethics and moral philosophy in a subcategory of pessimism. The main thesis of this book is that humans ought never to have been born. Following in the footsteps of antinatalist David Benatar, who published Better Never to Have Been Born in 2007, Ligorty doubles down on Benatar's position on the harm of coming into existence, and argues that humans should just become extinct. Moreover, we should take out life in general. In the book, Ligorty posits that consciousness was a blunder of nature, and is the root of all suffering. He argues the derived Buddhist position of dukkha, which translates as life is suffering. He establishes that most people are aware of this fact, but that we are nonetheless wired to be biased toward optimism through delusion, and what a psychoanalyst might call repressed memories. Moreover, pessimists are a cohort not tolerated by society, who don't want their delusions shattered. Philosophically, Ligorty is a determinist. I've created content on this topic, but in a nutshell, determinism is the belief that all events are caused by antecedent events, leading to a chain of causes and effects stretching back to the beginning of time and bringing us to where we are now. If we were able to rewind time and restart the process, we would necessarily end up in the same place, and all future processes will unfold in a like manner. Ligorty likes the metaphor of puppets. He employs puppets in two manners. Firstly, being the determinist he is, he reminds us that we are meat puppets with no free will. Our strings are controlled by something that is not us. This something ends up being Schopenhauer's will, reminding us that one can want what we will, but we can't will what we will. This will is the puppeteer. Secondly, puppets are soulless, lifeless homunculi that are employed in the horror genre to create unease by means of an uncanny association. He cites the work and philosophy of Norwegian author Peter Zapf, who also elucidates human existence as a tragedy. Humans are born with one and only one right, the right to die. And death is the only certainty. The knowledge of this causes unnecessary suffering. Quoting Ligorty. Stringently considered then, our only natural birthright is a right to die. No other right has ever been allocated to anyone, except as a fabrication, whether in modern times or days past. The divine right of kings may now be acknowledged as a fabrication, a falsified permit for prideful dementia and impulsive mayhem. The inalienable rights of certain people on the other hand, seemingly remain current, somehow we believe they are not fabrications because hallowed documents declare they are real. End quote. Ligorty reminds us that consciousness is a mystery. We don't really know what it is or what causes it other than it exists and we seem to have it, to be cursed with it. He adopts Zapp's position that consciousness is also responsible for the false notion of the self. As all life is, humans are the result of an evolutionary process. Consciousness was just the result of an evolutionary blunder. He cites Zapf and conveys that mutations must be considered blind. They work, are thrown forth, without any contact of interest with their environment. Whilst pessimists view consciousness as a curse, optimists such as Nicholas Humphrey think of it as a marvelous endowment. He summarizes the reason humans have it worse than the rest of nature. For the rest of the Earth's organisms, existence is relatively uncomplicated. Their lives are about three things, survival, reproduction, death, and nothing else. But we know too much to content ourselves with surviving, reproducing, dying, and nothing else. We know we are alive and know we will die. We also know we will suffer during our lives before suffering, slowly or quickly, as we draw near to death. This is the knowledge we enjoy as the most intelligent organisms to gush from the womb of nature. And being so, we feel short-changed if there is nothing else for us than to survive, reproduce, and die. We want there to be more to it than that, or to think there is. 
this is the tragedy, consciousness has forced us into the paradoxical position of striving to be unself-conscious of what we are, hunks of spoiling flesh on disintegrating bones. End quote. I'll repeat that, consciousness has forced us into the paradoxical position of striving to be unself-conscious, he cites Zapf's four principal strategies to minimize our consciousness, isolation, anchoring, distraction, and sublimation. 1. Isolation is compartmentalizing the dire facts of being alive. So he argues, that a coping mechanism is to push our suffering out of sight, out of mind, shoved back into the unconscious so we don't have to deal with it. 2. Anchoring is a stabilization strategy, by adopting fictions as truth. We conspire to anchor our lives in metaphysical and institutional verities. God, morality, natural law, country, family, that inebriate us with a sense of being official, authentic, and safe in our beds. 3. Distraction falls into the realm of manufactured consent. People lose themselves in their television sets, their government's foreign policy, their science projects, their careers, their place in society or the universe, etc. Anything not to think about the human condition. 4. Sublimation. This reminds me of Camus' take on the absurd. Just accept it. Embrace it and incorporate it into your routine. Pour it into your art or music. Ligorti invokes Camus' directive that we must imagine Sisyphus happy, but he dismisses the quip as folly. Ligorti underscores his thesis by referencing the works of other authors from David Benatar to William James. Interestingly, he suggests that people who experience depression are actually in touch with reality, and that psychology intervenes to mask it again with a preferred veil of delusion and self-deception. Society can't operate if people aren't in tune with the masquerade. Citing David Livingston Smith in his 2007 publication Why We Lie, The Evolution of Deception and the Unconscious Mind, Ligorti writes, Psychiatry even works on the assumption that the healthy and viable is at one with the highest in personal terms. Depression, fear of life, refusal of nourishment and so on are invariably taken as signs of a pathological state and treated thereafter. Ligorti returns to the constructed notion of the self and presents examples of how a lack of self is an effective horror trope, citing John Carpenter's The Thing and Invasion of the Body Snatchers. He spends a good amount of time on ego death and the illusion of self, a topic I've covered previously. He mentions Thomas Metzinger and his writings in several places including his Being No One, published in 2004, ostensibly reinforcing a position described as naive realism, that things not being knowable as they really are in themselves, something every scientist and philosopher knows. He delves into Buddhism as a gateway to near-death experiences, where people have dissociated their sense of self, illustrating the enlightenment by accident, of Yuji Krishnamurti, who after some calamity was no longer the person he once was, for now he was someone whose ego had been erased. In this state, he had all the self-awareness of a tree frog. To his good fortune, he had no problem with his new way of functioning. He did not need to accept it, since by his report he had lost all sense of having an ego that needed to accept or reject anything. Krishnamurti had become a veritable zombie. He also cited the examples of Tem Horvitz, John Ren Lewis, and Suzanne Segal, but I won't elaborate here. Russian romantic author, Leo Tolstoy, famous for war and peace and Anna Karenina was another pessimist. He noticed a coping approach his associates had employed to deal with their morality. 1. Ignorance is the first. As the saying goes, ignorance is bliss. For whatever reason, these people are simply blind to the inevitability of their mortal lives. As Tolstoy said, these people just did not know or understand that life is an evil and an absurdity. 2. Epicureanism comes next. The tactic here is to understand that we are all in here and no one gets out alive so we might as well make the best of it and adopt a hedonistic lifestyle. 3. Following Camus' cue, or rather Camus following Tolstoy and Schopenhauer, he suggests the approach of strength and energy, by which he means the strength and energy to suicide. 4. Finally, one can adopt the path of weakness. This is the category Tolstoy finds himself in, writing, People of this kind know that death is better than life, but not having the strength to act rationally, to end the deception quickly and kill themselves, they seem to wait for something. The last section of the book feels a bit orthogonal to the rest. I won't bother with details, but essentially he provides the reader with examples of how horror works by exploring some passages, notably Radcliffe's The Mysteries of Udolpho, Conrad's Heart of Darkness, Poe's Fall of the House of Usher, Lovecraft's Court of Cthulhu, and contrasting Shakespeare's Macbeth and Hamlet. This has been a summary of Thomas Ligorti's conspiracy against the human race. Here's my take. But first some background, as it might be important to understand where I'm coming from. I am a nihilist. I feel that life has no inherent meaning, but people employ existentialist strategies to create a semblance of meaning, 
much akin to Zapp's distraction theme or perhaps anchoring. This said, I feel that similar to anarchism, people don't understand nihilism. Technically, it's considered to be a pessimistic philosophy because they are acculturated to expect meaning, but I find it liberating. People feel that without some constraints of meaning, that chaos will ensue, as everyone will adopt Tolstoy's Epicureanism or to fall into despair and suicide. What they don't know is they've already fabricated some narrative and have adopted one of Zapp's first three offerings, isolation, which is to say repression, anchoring on God or country, or distracting themselves with work, thoughts, politics, social media, or reading horror stories. Because of my background, I identify with Ligorti's position. I do feel the suffering and anguish that he mentions, and perhaps I am weak in rationalizing, but I don't feel that things are so bad. I may be more sympathetic to Benatar's antinatalism than to advocate for a mass extinction event, though I feel that humans are already heading down that path. Perhaps this could be psychoanalyzed as collective guilt, but I won't go there. I recommend reading this. I knocked it out in a few hours, and you could shorten this by skipping the last section altogether. If you are on the fence, I'd suggest reading David Benatar's Better Never to Have Been. Perhaps I'll review that if there seems to be interest. If you've got the time, read both. So there you have it. That's my summary and review of Thomas Ligorti's The Conspiracy Against the Human Race. Before I end this, I'll share a personal story about an ex-girlfriend of mine. Although she experienced some moments of happiness and joy, she saw life as a burden. Because she had been raised Catholic and embodied the teachings, she was afraid that committing suicide would relegate her to hell. In fact, on one occasion, she and her mum had been robbed at gunpoint, and her mum stepped between my girlfriend and the gun. They gave the gunman what they wanted, so the situation came to an end. My girlfriend laid into her mother that if she ever did something like that again and took a bullet that was her ticket out, she would never forgive her. As it turned out, my girlfriend died as collateral damage during the COVID debacle. She became ill, but because she was living with her elderly mum, she didn't want to go to hospital and bring something back. One early morning, she was writhing in pain and her mum called the ambulance. She died later that morning in hospital, having waited too long. For me, I saw the mercy in it all. She got her ticket out and didn't have to face the hell eventuality. Not that I believe in any of that, but she was able to exit in peace. Were it not for the poison of religion, she could have exited sooner. She was not, in Tolstoy's words, weak, so much as she had been a victim of indoctrination. I feel this indoctrination borders on child abuse, but I'll spare you the elaboration. So, what are your thoughts on this book? Is there a conspiracy against humanity? Are optimists ruining it for the pessimists? What do you think about antinatalism or even extinction of all conscious beings or the extreme case of all life on earth? Is Ligorti onto something, or just on something? Share your thoughts in the comments below. Consider subscribing to this channel. If you like this video, click like so I can get a signal that you want more. If you want to be alerted when I publish more videos, click the bell icon. I'm Bri. This is my YouTube channel, and I blog at http colon slash slash philosophicsblog.wordpress.com. Check there and check back here for more content updates. Cheers.